the last day to finish that repair if we needed it. Now it looks like we'll only have the time on that third EVA to repair the advanced camera for surveys. So uh, if we don't get it all done then and the next day goes well, that work will just leave behind and we won't have that repaired. We are going out with a positive attitude that we'll do that repair and we'll do uh, what we can to get it done in one day, but we know things can be unexpected. If it doesn't, that's uh, the lowest priority that would drop off our list because the scientific instrument command and data handler is the top priority and it now moved into the first day EVA so we get it done as soon as possible so the ground can check it out and make sure everything looks good. It's been uh, seven months uh, from being ready to go, or at least we thought we were, to uh, now actually getting close to fly in May. Uh, and there was a little bit of time where we mourned a little bit for not going right away. But uh, one of the challenges I put to the crew and everybody else uh, and the Goddard folks is that we all use our time wisely. We had an opportunity to kind of review were we really as good as we thought we were. So we've tried, done that. Uh, we've looked at the procedures. I think we've gotten better. We've had a little more time in the pool. And the challenge has been to not just plateau and stay at the same place, but try to take ourselves up to the next stop. And uh, as I've looked back at it, we find, found things that we would have had questions about on orbit if we'd flown in October that now we've resolved and moved forward on. And I think we're just that much better prepared for actually flying and getting as much as we possibly can done in space. All right, we'll debrief downstairs. Okay, thanks. Go get comfortable, I'll bring you stuff. Yeah, I pulled my foot. But then he kept going. Okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah. yeah. Just thinking about that, too. <laughs> you go, I go. <laughs> hey, you good? Not my fault. We keep our salt. We try to maintain it. I don't know why I'm eating everything before I eat. Like, we got people pushing us. What's the highest? It's the same. I'm just thinking of the one like I see it right there. You guys are in the proper yeah. sense with that little okay. switch down. Yes, yes we, we both uh, talked about that. Yeah. So the inertial burn, is that where we are? First thing uh, we haven't gone inertial yet. Right. There's really... We are in the Z-axis. We don't have to go to... Risk is an interesting word. I've been in a lot of risky... Uh, business. I, I consider flying off aircraft carriers twice a day, every day, to be a risk uh, that I was willing to take. Uh, my initial cut on canceling the Hubble mission was that was a shame. I didn't know the technical details of, you know, what risk levels um, they had determined were too great. Um, so uh, my general idea was it was a shame. I think um, the fact that they have done so much to the external tank to reduce the shedding from the tank um, and then they've put another space shuttle on the opposite the other uh, launch pad to be launched within five days or so I think mitigates the risk down to uh, an acceptable level but it is still very risky and slightly more risky because it's at higher altitude and slightly more risky because it's in 28 and a half degree inclination those combinations make it a little more risky for MMOD hits well, I think it's going to be an exciting time. Uh, we certainly, in the first parts of the burns, will do some phasing burns to get to rendezvous with the telescope. Um, I'll be doing those burns, um, some of those burns from the commander's seat, uh, and then Scooter will be in the back uh, looking through the uh, optical sight at the telescope, along with Megan uh, monitoring the robotic arm. Um, I'm sort of the timeline master, or a checklist master, so I'll make sure that we haven't missed a step in the checklist. I'll be looking at the displays um, and talking to Scooter about the rendezvous. Of course, he'll get uh, the space shuttle right near Hubble, 
stop it right next to Hubble, basically in a very good position for Megan to go out and grapple it with the robotic arm. Once we get the grapple, then Megan will very gently uh, lift it uh, the size of a you know um, small bus and put it into the payload boy bay on the uh, the structure of the FSS, and then from there we'll be able to uh, move the the Hubble in a circle to, to open up different sides of the Hubble Space Telescope. Minus Z. Okay, you read that? It's just getting farther out. Super. Good exercise. Well I think it went pretty well on the flight deck at least. Yeah, it looks good downstairs as yeah. well. We got all our uh, switches pretty fast and we got the coffee with cream. Yeah, it was like nine somewhere yeah. right in there. I don't want any other thing. I don't want this. So that order This is a lie. But what I'll draw is way about, you know, with this little handle, it's up. That obviously kind of makes sense. Hats! Your first, your first hazard here is the gap. The diving board's on there. Make sure you can make sure you clear that gap right there. Original OBCC for the first attempt. And uh, we rotate. Yeah. You can fly around 70 knots ahead of but we'll check the wings as we are before we walk here. The um, SIC and DH, which is the Scientific Instrument Command and Data Handling, uh, redundant paths failed on Hubble. And uh, what that means is that for Hubble, we lost one of its, its backup channels for uh, basically command uh, and data handling for the scientific instruments on the telescope. And uh, I think, I believe Goddard at that time and NASA made a decision that uh, if we're going to go and do the servicing mission, it was important to have both of those uh, command and data handling paths available. Uh, so the decision was made to hold off on our launch, uh, look at options and opportunities to provide uh, additional hardware to um, you know, repair those problems during our servicing mission so that we can give, uh, you know, provide new components to not only the instruments themselves but also this uh, command and data handling box. I feel kind of lucky to be able to have a chance to actually be the one who puts the new box back in the, in the telescope. That said, uh, the task itself is very similar to what we were doing to replace batteries on, on, uh, you know, as part of the servicing mission and are still doing. So in terms of learning new uh, you know, techniques and, and um, uh, parts of our EVA or additions to the EVA, it really wasn't necessary. We were, I guess you could say we were already in a sense trained to install this box because its shape uh, it's, it's mass, it's, well, it's mass is different than the batteries, but it's, it's general size and installation uh, features are almost identical to what we do for, um, for the batteries that we're installing. Very similar uh, in terms of the techniques we use. Uh, so in that sense, I think we're well prepared for it. The real challenge was fitting it into the EVA, um, and, that, and that's what's taken a little bit of time to work through. Simple. 